Yeah, thanks. Great, thanks. Well, um, it's good evening for me. Um, it's almost gin and gin and tonic time, but not quite. Um, so thank you for a great afternoon. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about knowledge transfer um, and the importance of knowledge transfer um, in lots of different contexts. I've been involved with the NDM movement for a very long time, and I was probably one of the first people to actually partly complete a PhD um, in NDM. So if we're looking at the knowledge transfer examples that I've been in, involved with, I'm really concerned about education. Um, and I've, for the past five or six years, been teaching MBA students some of the advantages of cognitive task analysis and the critical decision method, and also undergraduate students, um, introducing them to the world of naturalistic decision making um, and the importance of being able to elicit tacit knowledge and build that back into all kinds of systems, be they paper and pencil e exercises or um, in a virtual world. Um, similarly, I've been involved with lots of people who are in this virtual room looking at military decision making in different contexts and looking at how we can accelerate expertise and how we can utilize um, knowledge that's domain specific and we can build that back into systems. Um, other areas that I've been involved with have been in the world of health um, and working in with the NHS in the UK and the World Health Organization, looking at everything from bed management decision making to looking at professionals who are involved um, in public health decision making um, during the pandemic, looking at multi-team systems. And one of the things that I'm really concerned about is the pragmatic knowledge that NDM can elicit and transfer for professionals. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a, an organization that I've been involved with for a long time, looking at how one can improve surveillance decision-making and what happened with the organization NASDAQ in terms of thinking about how you could improve um, decision-making processes of surveillance officers. So as part of the advisory panel um, for NASDAQ's behavioral science group, I worked with Wendy Jefferson. Oops. Apologies, there's a double, uh, I seem to have got, do you have double noise there? Nope, it sounds fine. Okay, um, sorry, in terms of thinking about the screenshot I'm just showing you there, um, that's an image of the type of things that surveillance officers are looking at when they're looking at the tricky domain of surveillance and trying to um, access knowledge which looks at um, problems when people are completing rogue trades. Now, rogue trades can be problematic for all kinds of different reasons. Um, and the complexity here, I think, is just shown in terms of looking at the, um, the systems that the operators are looking at. Um, and they have all kinds of different communication um, coming in at once. So they have lots of visual communication, they have rows and rows of data, and they also have e-comms communication where they have transcripts of telephone recordings of people making trades. And the surveillance officer's role is really to look at um, the critical points and problems of managing that relationship and to look for unusual behavior. Um, and I was involved at the very early stages of this very large project um, with NASDAQ to help practitioners identify um, critical cues of experts in surveillance. And we managed, managed to identify lots of the critical cues that those people, surveillance officers who are really good at spotting rogue traders, what they did in this situation. And as a result of spotting those critical cues um, in tacit knowledge, they were documented and built back into the system to help training of new surveillance officers to improve their cognition and to look at situations that they previously wouldn't looked at, have looked at and were given cognitive cues and nudges to carry out more positive behavior. Um, I think, this is a really interesting um, area 
the NDM has been involved in. Um, and lots of the work that um, I get involved with looks at being able to bridge the practitioner um, kind of academic divide, taking the science to practice in order to improve decision thinking and decision behavior. NASDAQ are continuing to develop nudges based on the critical decision making um, interviews that we completed with expert surveillance officers um, and that work is ongoing um, and it's a great illustration I think of how um, nudges and cues can be built back um, into systems. Um, other areas that are of importance um, in my work um, looking at utilising the bridge between novices and practices uh, and practitioners. Um, as an academic, um, much of my research has been sponsored by UKRI, which is a large research funding body in the UK, which is very concerned with developing and collaborating um, with practitioners and academics. And the Centre for Research Evidence and Security Threats um, was one of the first hubs it's um, the first UK behavioural science hub, which focuses upon complex decision making and security threats. Um, and the tiny little article there on decision making, which is less than 400 words, completed with um, Gareth Conway from DSDL and Paul Ward, um, now at MITRE, is probably one of my most read publications. It summarises the naturalistic decision-making approach and why and how it's useful within practice in terms of developing those paper and pencil techniques, alternate tools, and also um, virtual tools too. Um, Sprite and Describe are also two other large networks in the UK that bring together researchers and practitioners. Um, and each of these networks are looking more and more at security issues, privacy, identity. I noticed there was lots of conversation in the chat about who's looking at cybersecurity. Um, these three networks in the UK are having a multidisciplinary approach to looking at the problems of decision making and sharing tacit knowledge amongst practitioners. Um, in terms of where things are going next, I'm sure that you're all aware that of the Oxford Handbook of Expertise that we produced um, with many of the collaborators on the call today. Um, over 150 authors have contributed to that volume. And I think at the heart of good science and good empirical inquiry uh, that the critical decision methods have afforded in terms of accessing people's tacit, tacit knowledge. I think it's a great insight um, and it's very exciting that each of those authors at the end of their chapters talk about the future of naturalistic decision making and how that can be applied within different domain contexts. Um, so if there's one question that I would like um, to share with everybody in terms of thinking about how can practice and academia come together. The question that, that the knowledge audit has, it, which is an applied cognitive task analysis, is why is this difficult? Why is it difficult to share expert knowledge um, from novices to experts? And answering that question, I think, um, can be found in lots of naturalistic decision-making inquiry. Um, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with a new generation of people looking at solving that question and also working with practitioners. If anybody would like to get in touch or if any, um, there are any students who are completing PhDs who need require more references, et cetera, um, I'm very happy to share them. Thank you.